Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your watch care. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We ask now that you would lead us in our meeting today. We pray that you would bless each of us, and especially our visitors. We pray for our country, especially our new president and leaders. We ask now that you would lead us and guide us and direct us in all the things that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Next, we have a roll call. Julia Katz? Here. Tom Garvin? Here. Phil England? Here. Phil John Baker? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Harley Buzzard? Here. Bradley Cobb? Here. Joe Crittenden? Here. Jody Fishinghaw? Here. Meredith Fraley? Here. Janelle Fulbright? Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Here. China Glory Jordan? Present. Curtis Snell? Here. Chris Sutt? Here. David Thornton? Here. Carrie Oh, honey. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the January 13th meeting. I move to be approved. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next, we'll hear our reports, beginning with Ms. Kelly from Career Services. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the council. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Got my report. Uh, you had an opportunity to look it over. You have any questions? Uh, I'm available to answer the best that I can. And I just want to remind everybody that we do have uh, our job corps graduation coming up the 20th, and it's going to be in the morning as opposed to the afternoon in previous years. It will be around uh, 10, 10.30, I believe, is the time, and the uh, speaker is Jay Hamm. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear the executive director's report. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Council Members. You have our reports as uh, submitted. I would be happy to address any questions or items of discussion that you might have. Mr. Hostin? Thank you, Mr. Madam Chairman. And Dr. Horn, I appreciate you got me some quick information in advance of the meeting that I attended yesterday evening at White Oak School. And as you know, and as committee members and the chairman may not know, White Oak School is facing a very significant financial crisis. In March, voters will go to the polls to determine whether they're going to keep K through 12 or reduce it to K through 8. If they keep K through 12, through 12 it will involve elimination of some positions and consolidation of some classes. Uh, and it really stems from just a decline in enrollment. Uh, the meeting I attended last night was also attended by uh, Chief Wycliffe of the Katuas, who's a former superintendent of White Oak, and he expressed with no specificity, uh, from where I sat, some optimism that the Katuas might help. I made clear that while we sympathize, uh, I knew of no specific plans that uh, we, could, we had to help the school other than what we already do on a continual basis and that uh, I didn't know of any programs that would uh, come to the rescue and certainly we have a compressed time period within which that community has to act so I'm not optimistic that anyone in the state, the tribe or anyone can come in to save the day but I didn't want to report to the committee that that is going on at White Oak School and there is a significant uh, Cherokee population in that small school district. <coughs> I appreciate your assistance, Tim. Very good. Thank you. I did follow up this morning and meet with the superintendent and um, expressing that uh, basically just what you've said, that the time, time, time constraint is such that uh, as far in the hole as they are, that it would be uh, almost impossible to uh, put them back <coughs> on. Awesome. I did uh, offer some um, help for the rest of this school year in an after-school uh, Cherokee language program if they, if they so desired to do that and, uh, uh, for two reasons. One, because language is one of our top priorities, and two, it would open the door that the Cherokee Nation is in fact ready to do what it can do. And so 
Uh, he seemed very, very appreciative of that, and I'll follow through with him. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Watts? Thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you for, to you and all your staff for another successful science engineering there. It was just outstanding, and I know that we probably lost a lot of people because of the ice storm alone. <coughs> we had over 132 participants still, mm -hmm. even with all that with said. With all of that. Yeah, and if you haven't had an opportunity to visit during that time, I mean, it's just outstanding. Mm -hmm. And the kids' projects, the quality has improved in the last three years. That was obvious to me, and I didn't have time to, to go through every one of them like I normally would. And it was just exciting. Um, and I just appreciate all that hard work that I know that was in for everybody that was there that day. The question I had was, uh, you do mention Cherokee scholars on there. Um, when do we expect, do we expect to implement before the end of the year so that there's maybe an opportunity for the first class by May or if there's folks that might already qualify? Yes. Will, will you give us kind of more detailed update maybe next month? If that's Be happy to, okay. to put that on the agenda for, for if, next If you have room, I would appreciate that being on the agenda, Very just good. an update on how they're going to implement Cherokee Scholars. Thank you, Dr. Morton. And Thank yes, you. the, uh, the uh, fair is uh, indicative of the increasing <coughs> amounts of support among the public schools and STEM programs. And we've just really, we've just begun on that. When we can get robotics programs into the public schools as we have in Sequoia now, um, you know, a, a, slate, a slate and a piece of chalk won't do it anymore. We've got to have those things that excite kids because uh, it's more important that we excite the kids than it is to excite the teachers at this point. Because the kids are uh, the kids are the ones that that get things done. So we have in in three short years uh, made amazing progress in STEM programs. Is there any chance that, that maybe those award winners could bring the <coughs> at the next council meeting or something, just to have in the room to, or outside to show folks? We would be happy Those that are going to NASA. In the lobby. And yeah, so that would forth. be awesome. Thank you. Very good. Ms. Jordan? Uh, Dr. Morton, I've had an inquiry <coughs> from a constituent that's concerned, and I really don't know how to answer a question, so I'll pose a question to you, and maybe you could okay. give me some more information. Uh, there's a concern about the dropout rate at the immersion program, and I couldn't recall that we had ever seen statistics on how many we take in and how many finish the semester or finish the year. And there was a concern and I, uh, about whether we were going to uh, uh, incorporate the English language into the immersion program eventually. And I'll just give you all of our questions. So we were going to add the fourth, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classes and how we are covering incorporating <coughs> academics into our immersion program so that if the children go out later into another school, they'll be up to school requirements mm -hmm. in science, math, English. And I just wondered if you could maybe address that next month or if you would prefer to just address it in just a little memo form. I, I can do that in uh, both ways. How about if I do it memo form, and then if there are further questions next month, we can we can uh, discuss those questions. <coughs> it would help let me, let me answer the right? last question first. Now, the academic. Yes, the academic issue. Uh, we will be adding fourth grade next year, and then the following year fifth grade, then the following year sixth grade, and then maintenance classes in seventh and eighth grade, and then. Cherokee 1, 2, 3, and 4 throughout Sequoia High School, the four years of Sequoia High School, so that those students who choose to will leave Sequoia High School at translation, translation stage and then would be moving right on into our NSU program in Cherokee language, which will, by the way, next year go under a major revision. 
So we have an overall plan to just take them all the way to the school? Yes. And as far as the uh, attention to English language, which has been a major concern since the program was started, uh, hey, what happens to my child if I get an opportunity to go to work away from here and I take my child out at third grade level? Well, at third grade, we are introducing English language instruction directly keyed to State Department pass mandates, pass skills. Plus, in the after school, we're offering an optional <coughs> voluntary of uh, English language curriculum, the same plan that Tahlequah Public Schools is using for those parents who opt for their children to have additional instruction in English language so that when they do transition to another school, whether it be in Cherokee County or whether it be anywhere, that they will be equipped to not only uh, address state mandated or federally mandated tests adequately, but uh, we have uh, research to show that after fourth grade, that the student who is bilingual will surpass his monolingual cohorts. So it is a concern, and it really the concern usually comes from grandparents who had trouble themselves in school because of actual discrimination, because they, they spoke another language. Whereas in Europe and all of the other industrialized countries of the world, speaking two languages or three languages or four languages or seven languages is considered to be academic success. Only in the United States and specifically Oklahoma do we compare that, do we, do we consider that a person who is monolingual and perhaps monolingual at only uh, very basic terms is superior to a bilingual person. But uh, you might also, yeah. in that memo, if you didn't care, address the dropout rate. Yes. And I think you've, you've hit on and English at the fourth, fifth, and mm -hmm. sixth. And, and it, the dropout rate is not high. It's, it's, it's very, very low. And then are we testing the children as they would be tested if they were in? Um, say one of the grade schools so down starting here. with with third grade third grade mm -hmm. and we test them in all of the academic areas yes okay. mm -hmm. thank you Appreciate and we're of course we're applying for accreditation of the program uh, so that it will not it will be a fully accredited program <coughs> umbrella of Sequoia thank you because that's another thing that scares people when it says you're pro accredited. Well, no, it is not. You know, it's an experimental private school program. Next year, it will be fully state accredited. Thank you, Beth. Mr. Baker. Yes, Dr. Borton. I understand that Skelly School at Chewy is facing a similar situation as White Oak. Yes. They also had a community meeting last night. I know the Cherokee Nation has been in some discussion with them. Right. Could you give us an update on that school? Skelly School, of course, it could be compared quite favorably or unfavorably, whichever, whichever stance we took, with Lost City. In other words, we lose uh, Skelly School, we lose <coughs> Chewy. We lose Chewy as Cherokee community. Um, Totally different situations as far as uh, motivation on the part of school personnel to keep the school open. The superintendent is retired. Uh, I've been in contact with him for the past month. Uh, he um, does not want any waves. He wants to retire quietly and move on to his 
retirement home in Eureka Springs, and he is not interested in talking to Cherokee Nation about anything associated with that school. Uh, and I think it's rather tragic since he is a uh, Cherokee citizen. Um, the school uh, could, in my opinion, um, survive next year by taking some uh, immediate actions in uh, combining some classes. They have probably the uh, smallest pupil-teacher ratio in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, they could combine some classes. They could bite the bullet and risk some people, but they won't do that. Um, they have a full-time um, special ed teacher. When most schools that size or even larger than that contract for their special ed uh, work at a fraction of the cost. So, uh, quite frankly, at present, there is not that much interest in saving Kelly School. They've already, they've already carved it up as to uh, where students may go and may not go. It would probably be more than one district. So they've had some districts in um, vying for some of those students. And again, uh, I'm not pulling any punches here. I'm telling you the, what the actual facts are. Um, there are not any forces, any organized forces at least, um, interested in uh, Cherokee Nation intervention at present. And it is a shame. Yes, as it was my understanding from talking to some of the community people that the community people were keeping it open, but the administration and the school board themselves, and at least one school board member sent their students to a private school elsewhere, right. then uh, they're not interested in no. keeping it open. But that the community as a whole probably is. And they, they have had representatives from the State Board of Education in to advise them. And their advice has been to close the school. In fact, in visiting with one of those persons uh, last Thursday, um, he mentioned that school was in trouble and they were, had no option. I mentioned to him they actually did have an option um, as of last year, you know, through the uh, legislation passed last year. The school does. Uh, the school does have an option if the State Board of Education will exercise that option. But it said the State Board of Education may contract with an Indian tribe to operate school for up to two years until the school is on sound footing and can be turned back to the community. But his, his response was, yes, but uh, tribes do not want to do that. Um, so, or not tribes, schools. Schools do not really want to do that. Okay. So we appreciate your update on that. I'm particularly interested since that is where I started. But again, school. having you know the, known about Skelly School for a long time, of course, not nearly as long as you, because that's your home area. Yes. It it is a sad thing. Yes, it is to see the school go when uh, the people who should be trying to save it are hastening it on down the road. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. <coughs> Next we'll hear from Head Start, Ms. Thompson. I'd be happy to field any questions um, from my written reports. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have J.O.M., uh, Dr. Butler Allen. OCO. No. I'd be happy to field any questions. We have my report in front of you. I do have something to pass out to you all. Mm -hmm. Once again. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yeah, really, every time. <laughs> 
Um, we are having our Oklahoma JOM State Conference uh, March the 23rd through the 26th. And so it's become a little bit of a competition among the tribes. There are four tribes plus BIA that host this conference. And so we have a huge banquet uh, on the third day, the third evening of the conference. And each tribe gets to uh, um, or attempts to have uh, more number of tribal council members and elected officials at their banquet. So, <laughs> you know, each year I, I say, please think about coming to our banquet. It's, it's, it's really nice. We award the exemplary um, JOM um, Indian Parent Committee um, programs as well as the art competition winners for the state conference. And this year we have first place and second place winners of the state art competition. So here's an application. We'd love to have you there for the whole week, but we all we know that schedules are real you're real busy and so we'd really like to have you on the banquet night. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. And from Sequoia High School we have Ms. Stanley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You have my report, and I'll be happy to address any questions you may have. So, are there any questions? <laughs> Mr. Thornton. Uh, I was maybe just interested in the number of students in the school high school. Uh, right nine now we're through 12. 9 through 12. Mm -hmm. We're right at about 350, close to 350. Now I will say we hosted the 8th grade day this past Wednesday and have had a lot of response. We had over 470 kids and sponsors here for not very many slots so we've already received three applications and we have parents coming in on a daily basis so I just say that for you to prepare because there's going to be people complaining in your areas. How many applications are on file? Pardon me? How many applications are on file for next year? Right now we've already received over 30. 30? Which is pretty early. We usually don't start getting them in until mid-spring. Okay. At 350 is... That as many as you can handle? Um, our, the buildings are actually designed for 300. So 350, we've actually pushed it a little bit. We're getting ready to have a, a classroom expansion that would allow us a few more kids. Um, we we have to really push it to go much beyond that. Thanks. We're only losing 69, uh, around 60, 69, I think, seniors is what we have this year. So that's not very many kids to feel. Thank you. You're welcome. Any others? Any questions? Okay. okay thank you. I do want to invite everybody to districts. We're hosting districts at the place where they play on Friday night. The game starts at 6 30. We'll be playing West. The uh, Cultural Resources Center from Dr. Sly. Excuse me, you had the report or answer any questions you might have this time? Any questions? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to old business then. And we have the uh, grave marker uh, discussion with you, Dr. Sly, as well. You have some additional information for us, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, as far as costs, is that right? As far as costs? Um, did everyone receive this, or I know I did. Everyone received it. Everyone got it. Okay. Everyone received it. Yes, it was in my monthly report. Uh, all I was looking for was the approval of the individual markers, and then Councilman Baker will be providing me, Jack Baker will be providing me with the inscription for the historical site markers. So, um, those are the only businesses that we have uh, around the markers and headstone. I mean. Okay. So you just need approval from this body to go ahead with this uh, design, uh, or is that already? The design on the historical marker, mm -hmm. yes, because we were looking at that change. Right. I need approval on that, uh, and then I have received approval now with the initials on this and, and changes on these for the, to order the uh, individual grade sign markers. But on the historical marker, 
I will need approval to go forward with that. Okay. Mr. Baker? I make a motion that we approve the design for the latest historical marker, the latest design that you showed us for the second. Okay. There is a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? There's the approval. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Moving on, we have new business, and I believe we have a presentation from Chief Smith and Dr. Morton and Mr. Enloe, apparently. <laughs> Slideshow to give you an overview of the education plan. So I'll go through this and ask you to ask questions. Long and short of it, the process of the education plan will take about six months. Then the March will have the first meeting that will be done on a monthly basis with subgroups. At the end of the process, we'll have a report out to each of the subgroups, memorialize that, synthesize those. The input into a document that should help us make the decisions about future investment in education. So the point to makes a lot more sense when we the entire project. So. The thing that you'll see is that we, we want to focus the plan on substantive education issues as opposed to traditional silos. Instead of Stepping out saying this is not high school or college or go tech or such. There's a series of educational concepts and we're the ones that work all the way through post secondary and we think we can um, organize our thoughts and plan easier. Okay. Well, we start with our overall strategy for the crime, and we focus on jobs, language, and community. We've had groups of staff to work on and strategic work teams, and they've looked at these long-term strategies and different perspectives. We have to prepare to respond to the economy, not only the current economy, but the economy we'd like to design for the next 20 years. And then we need to use our competitive intelligence. And this is sort of a word we need to find a separate word, set of words for, but intelligence is anything we can do through thought or crafts or creativity. Competitive is, can we do as well or good as anybody else? And so Cherokee's had great competitive intelligence. Some competitive intelligence you can see of other tribes, your Mohawks are great iron workers, uh, Navajo silversmiths, Samoans are, are football players, Detroit's known for cars, uh, Santa Barbara's known for ships, and uh, Wall Street's known for disaster. And so, as competitive intelligence for us, we have great competitive intelligences, and one of them that we may have not thought about when we started our gaming operation, but we believe is that our people are nurturing people who like to help each other. So when we train them to be customer service people in the casinos, they do it very well and have got outstanding reputation for that. So within the overall context of our overall strategy, uh, the concept is we should design uh, an economy and align on the for that. So our ultimate goal for our people, we believe, is to become a happy and healthy people. 
self-reliant, engaged. So we design an economy that creates jobs uh, through our expansion and our <coughs> diversification, entrepreneurialism, you know, help people become businessmen, attract new industry. So we got lots of programs to do that. And we should align our education to take those jobs to this future economy. And so in that education, we build on our inherent cultural attributes, skills. We all become lifelong learners so we can have multiple occupations and vocations to, to, uh, through our life. And that's all based and built upon this competitive intelligence. And if we translate it very simply, what do we enjoy doing? What do, can we do as good or better than others? So basically it's the alignment between what we enjoy doing, how what we enjoy doing is as good or better than anybody else, we align or develop our education with that. Our economy is based upon that competitive intelligence. And ultimately, it helps lead us as a body to a happy, healthy people. Okay. <coughs> so the second step of that is our education plan. And our product is to build, is to produce leaders to rebuild a nation to be a happy, healthy people. And some of our preliminary observations are these. Uh, we should help our children achieve their childhood dreams. Uh, Neil Morton reflects upon a study done in Bell several years ago. And in that study, they asked fourth graders, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of course, they said, you know, the doctors, lawyers, and the chiefs, like most kids, had great aspirations, very healthy uh, views of themselves and what they could do. He asked the same kids in eighth grade, what do you want to grow up to And they said, be on welfare, work at the chicken factories, catch chickens. So what happened in that five-year period to the aspirations for children? What happened to their childhood dreams? I mean, we've done a lot of studies from a lot of different places. Uh, even when I was in college, there were studies that Indian children uh, excel into the fifth grade and something happens and they just drop off the academic. And we, we all know the social rules we fight each day with methamphetamine and dropout, child abuse, obesity. Uh, and so we're developing studies to try to figure out what happens after the fifth grade. And another bit of intelligence that we stumbled across, and there's a great small book, and this guy was actually an Oprah. His name is Randy Posh. He wrote the book, The Last Lecture. He was a computer scientist and his professor at Carnegie Mellon, one of the premier universities in technology. At age 47, he found he had pancreatic cancer. And he, before he learned that, the university had this tradition of professors delivering the last lecture. If you were actually going to die, what would be your last lecture? Well, the great irony is this really was him, because he only had three or four months to live. So he delivered his last lecture, and he wrote a book on it. And basically, the thesis and the theme of the book is this. He looked back to his childhood dreams, and was he able to accomplish them? And because of great parents, great opportunity, great drive, in some form or fashion, he was able to accomplish those childhood dreams. For example, he wanted to be an astronaut. Well, he never did become an astronaut, but in his career, he had the opportunity to go with NASA to be in a weightless airplane who almost emulate being an astronaut. Uh, right out of school, he wanted to be an Imagineer from Walt Disney. They wouldn't hire him. But 20 years later, he was the expert in virtual reality simulation, and they hired him as a consultant. So he looked back through his life, and he was able to capture and to achieve his childhood dreams. And the more research we do, we tend to believe but that's probably what's miss, missing in the Cherokee Nation in Indian country. Our kids are not connected with the dots. They start off with great childhood dreams, but something happens. They never achieve them. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing that we haven't completely seized upon, but it's a really a quite interesting concept. So our product is to produce leaders, and the process to do that is education. Our product is to build leaders, to rebuild our nation, and education is that process. And there's a great Cherokee cultural concept that Benny Smith shared with us, and it comes from this prayer, uh, <coughs> the tradition of going to war. And if you 
loosely translating that prayer is that you acknowledge when the sun comes up, it illuminates the entire world. And as the sun rises, and it brings light to different things and creates shadows. The prayer is to learn from all that I observe during that day, from the early morning hours to midday to the time the sun is, sun is setting. From all that you observe, you learn. <coughs> The ending of the prayer is, is that by the end of the evening, you're a wiser, smarter, happier person. So the product is leadership, the process is education. Part of the product we want to build on is a plan, a written plan, that helps direct people and resource to align with economy or academics. What is our competitive intelligence? What do charities like to do? Establish goals for the 5, 10, and 20 year frames. Develop a communication plan so we can share with all of our neighbors and those interested, those people in education, leadership, the community. Develop a relationship between the community and the tribe to affect and to accomplish this long term plan and to accomplish our long term uh, strategy, and that is jobs, language, and community. So the principles that we've initiated is that it should be a continuous learning curriculum from preschool to adult education. So we want to fo focus on the process and the concepts rather than classic silos in the education planning process. We need to organize on learning disciplines rather than organizations. Look at the idea of, of cultural education from little ones to big ones rather than just talking about uh, J-O-M or talking about high school or just talking about secondary education. <coughs> the other thing is to leverage our existing systems. It really doesn't make a lot of sense for us to create duplicate institutions. Instead of building six high schools and another two colleges, perhaps we should use the resources available to us and figure out how we can use those to help us allow our kids to achieve their childhood dreams. And existing systems are not only formal systems, but informal systems. Uh, tutorials, apprenticeships, uh, community education. Then another principle is to enhance our formal education and training systems, for example, higher education and technical training. And then proceed with demonstrating model systems rather than creating a whole uh, fleet of duplicate systems. For example, Sequoia can be the model, the tested model in Leadership Academy, Head Start and Immersion, leadership and develop a curriculum for uh, language immersion. And then interject uh, language, history, and culture with the existing curriculum. <coughs> the people we want to invite to uh, this process is anybody who's interested in education. In particular, this is a class where some of those people will have uh, very clear invitations to come and participate. I'm not going to read through all of those, but you can see the kinds of classes of people. And it's not only education people, but it's community people and it's health people. For example, one of the bits of intelligence that we've initially assessed is that one of the reasons kids at the fifth grade may drop off is that their uh, dietary habits change dramatically at the fifth grade. And so the integration of health care, uh, dietary, uh, a lifestyle may help a child achieve his childhood dreams, allow him to continue his academic excellence that he has at fifth grade, getting into the seventh, ninth, and twelfth, and junior college levels. Business and industry, uh, get people from the outside to help us look at how the economy works and how we can align our education uh, efforts. Apple people, we went to Apple about a month ago. <coughs> Really brilliant people at Apple, Apple have an affinity for the Cherokee Nation. They want to come and participate. So it's that kind of class of folks. Uh, people in this uh, community, uh, Miss Cherokee, or Tommy Tucker. Uh, if you know Tom Tucker, he's been our pilot for 38 years. He's a campus minister. He's, he's coached and counseled <coughs> the kids from little to old. He's got great insight. And so this list is not exhaustive, but anybody who's interested in charity leadership and education would like to come from the initial organization meeting and participate. Okay. So here's where the process starts. We have a steering committee, which will help do exactly that and steer the process. They'll be present at the final, at the kickoff and the final meetings. So 
the participants will meet at an initial meeting, and then we'll meet each at the first of each month for a total of four months. We'll have a tribal staff to help guide the process under the direction of the steering committee. For the first of each month, the, the educational concepts or curriculum streams or disciplines or ideas will be organized by jobs, language, and community. So after we meet the first month, in the first meeting we'll organize into sub-teams. And they will meet weekly or bi-weekly and we'll report back to the large group at the monthly meeting. So here are the design groups under jobs, entrepreneurial skills, life skills, job preparedness, career development, STEM, which is science and technology, engineering, and math, the arts. And all the ideas here is how do we prepare our kids to support and grow the economy. And the reason we keep talking about the economy is that we don't want the third trail of tears. And we know what the first one was, March from Georgia. The second was the Depression. Half of our population left Oklahoma between 1930 and 1940 to get a job. And we're on the verge of a third trail of tears because our kids have to go someplace else to get the kind of jobs that they enjoy and what they can contribute back to the tribe. So that's why we need to design the economy and have the curriculum and the educational skills prepare our kids to take that economy over and over. Language, we probably need a better word there, but that's really cultural intelligence. <coughs> it's the attributes, the intelligence, the thinking, and creativity that's embodied in our culture. Uh, part of language is cultural identity, our attributes, reading and writing in the language, lifelong learning from uh, how to make uh, fry bread and and the dog ears to uh, stick ball sticks and sing uh, our songs. Then the competitive intelligence that's embedded to, you know, values and attributes. And the last class is community. The communities of interest, how we coordinate those between the higher education, the common schools, and the preschools, and our own programs, how they can be leveraged out. The education systems, our charities and leadership roles, Social economic factors that affect children from going from the childhood dreams to not. And then civic issues uh, and how we participate in overall community, political and uh, um, uh, community process. So here's our work plan. We'll charge each one of those groups with this question. How can we use, for example, science, technology, engineering, and math to produce happy and healthy uh, leaders to build a nation? So the subgroup, uh, day one, we'll, we'll have these subgroups set out there. We'll ask people to volunteer, and we'll actually have some people will ask to sit on these groups, and for, like science and math. The question that they should answer is how can we use science, technology, engineering, and math to produce happy and healthy leaders to build a nation? Then the second question is how is that accomplished at each age level? So we begin with very little ones and grow that all the way to the end of the educational process because the ultimate product is those uh, leaders who can use science and math to rebuild our nation. Now let me give you an example of how can we use the attributes, the cultural attributes of these happy and healthy leaders in the nation. How is this accomplished at each age level? So the one of the first things we'll, we would look at, what are those attributes? And we spent a lot of time with traditional folks, and this is the attributes that there's general consensus around. Respect, integrity, being a teacher, being self-confident, exercise and charity way of life, exercising leadership, being determined, persistent, communicate well, show the strength, the personal character strength, be cooperative, uh, exercise responsibility, be patient and humble. And so how can we develop programs or how do we use those attributes, how do we develop uh, educational initiatives to teach those attributes from little ones to big ones? And so what might happen, as an example, is a committee may recommend things like reading programs and programs to stay in school or initiatives and different kind of teaching methods where it's not only a, a 
an oral teaching method, but it may be a tactile or an experiential or a um, visual teaching method. How to develop initiatives to get family support to teach those attributes. And it may not just be at school. It may be uh, you know, weekends with elders. Um, perhaps we need to capture for inspiration the aspirations of our elders. And many of our parents have lost those aspirations. They're part of that class that have failed to achieve their childhood dreams, but their grandparents still have that idea. And when we were all growing up, our grandparents and aunts and uncles said, you need to get an education. Of course, we didn't know what that meant, but we know we need to go get it. And so maybe we need to catalog and capture and build upon those aspirations that our grandparents have for us and our children and their grandchildren. For programs to have to pursue happiness and define happiness and find the resolution to do that. Uh, skills and dispute resolution, and critical thinking, and even initiatives how to reduce the fear of failure and fear of success. And there was a great um, movie, uh, uh, the name of it is slipping, Coach something. Coach Carr, thank you. And one of the great uh, highlight scenes in that, he, <coughs> he keeps pounding in this, he's a black coach, he keeps pounding in this Puerto Rican boy and says, what are, you, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? This kid was a street wise kid. And he says, I'm not afraid of anything. And he finally, after he drops out of school and comes back and asks to be reinstated, Coach Carter asks him again, What are you afraid of? And he, it ultimately dawns on him, he's afraid to succeed. He can live with failure because that's what his whole community is part of. But if he succeeds, then no longer is he part of that community. But people start looking down on him like that. So it's not only a, fail of, a fear of failure in our communities we perhaps we need to address, but maybe it's a fear of success. So those are suggestions, they're not suggesting, there's possibilities that this one subcommittee, this one design group could come up with on how we could best teach our attributes or how we could use those attributes to build leaders to rebuild the Cherokee Nation and become happy, healthy people. So here's our timeline. On March 25th, we'll have a kickoff meeting. Anybody and everybody wants to come are welcome. And then the following monthly meeting will be May 1st, and we'll give you this in writing so you don't have to write it down. Okay. Uh, unless you don't trust me. They could get lost before you hear the complex. <laughs> and so uh, you'll see a uh, first meeting is a kickoff meeting, the orientation, organization meeting. It'll last probably half a day or six hours, 46 hours. So it's going to be a long event, where it's going to be very intense. Then after, we'll have two monthly meetings, which subgroups will report out. Then we'll have a final monthly meeting. I guess we've got three monthly meetings. And then a final uh, presentation on July 24th, in which we will have organized all the, the data, <coughs> the recommendations, the ideas, and they'll be presented out. Then on August 31st, <coughs> uh, we'll finalize a report we'll present it to the committee steering committee they'll approve it and then we'll publish it okay next and so the first meeting will be this we'll have introductions we'll have video presentations to get the points uh, very clear so we're all on the same page so a video showing graphically that the concept of learning from all that I observe uh, uh, maybe video clips or personal testimonies by leaders of the community uh, of their aspirations to rebuild the Cherokee Nation and become a happy, healthy people. <coughs> Define our purpose again and put words to it that we can all understand and hang on to for that six month period. And so far, the idea of allowing students to achieve their childhood dreams seems so, so powerful. Uh, and we'll share with the group. Uh, with more detail in the fourth and eighth grade aspiration stories. We'll have prepared and synthesized data and statistics on performance, academics, dropout rates, those kind of things that uh, we would all want to have at our disposal to make informed decisions. We'll share with the group this alignment model that I shared with you uh, in a small degree earlier. We'll be more specific. Overall strategy about jobs, language, community. And then Yes, uh, community member commentaries on the, the value of success, and particular difficult issues they had when they were younger. And 
the attributes of getting a success. Uh, for example, Job Story has a great success they have a story. They had a young man who went through their program, went on to get a PhD, and was the head of one of the it's called the charity, the head of one of the um, um, science operations with uh, I think the uh, uh, aeronautical. <coughs> Stories about students we lose from the eighth grade to uh, ninth grade because they transfer from school to school and get lost. Community member commentaries on you know the value of opportunity and hopefully some visions of our elders of what they want their grandchildren. So if y'all have any ideas like that or stories, if you'd like to give some, we can do a video. We'd like to set the tone of the meeting, that kind of visual impressions. And then we'll go on to define the subject matters and the disciplines, the traditional and what is higher education to us for the purpose of the plan, public schools, STEM, art, and the definition of each of our uh, design groups. So, here's where we're at now. And here's where I would ask for you all to start participating. We've charged about 50 of our group leaders and staff already to do this. Is In your own experience, in your own academic uh, uh, discipline or things that you stumble across. Help us with the data that we can assemble for this first meeting. If there's studies you see out there that really pertain to Cherokees that we ought to have, send it over to us. If there's a study that you see by a Parvi group in Los Angeles and has parallels with things that we're facing, send it to us. If you have a set of data for performance of the school that you don't think we have, send it to us. We're, we're already evaluating Diane of Hammond. She got really interested and she started looking at the performance indicators for schools in Adair County. And she began to ask and wonder, why is a lot of those schools so poor? But schools like um, Galatagy and what is a school just south of Stillwell? Zion. Zion. Why do they do so well? What's the differentiating factors? Is it staff? Is it teachers? Is it facilities? Is it, you know, what is the dis distinguishing factor? You know, why do those kids eventually you know, do, seem to do well? Uh, and are they actually achieving their childhood? Outside the discipline of, of education, is there nutrition studies? Are there social service studies about family support? Are there stories, uh, uh, studies about extracurricular activities? And if uh, Gina Stanley was here, I'd ask her to do one about Sequoia. A very simple model that when you raise athletics, you raise the interest in the community, you begin to draw leaders, your academics follows, and then your extracurriculars follows. It's a very simple model, but it, look for Sequoia's coming five years. Very successful in the community. The effects of other kind of extracurricular activities in arts education. Our youth choir is a, is a great example. Look what happened to those kids. It'd be interesting to study the kids in the youth choir with their peers and see if they've done better in their academic <coughs> and socialization as opposed to other kids. And I can get you a half, I can get you a dozen of anecdotal stories saying how those kids have been so much better having been in the youth choir, having been out in the public, and having been able to, to see the world and be on stage and have to perform. So we want to take every opportunity to get every bit of intelligence, study or data or research out there so that we can synthesize it and put it in a booklet for that first day of organization. And so if you can send that to us, either hard copy or by email to the address there, the email address, we'll begin that process. Okay. So in summary, the education plan is a community organized, organized team approach working together to align our education system to build leaders to rebuild the nation. It'll help us direct how we spend our resources for higher education, child care, after school programs, and other sources. So the, uh, in the future, when we sit down at budget time and we pass legislation, we will have this body of knowledge, this plan to help us allocate our resources design programs and allocate our resources and funds for all the things that we normally see in the education committee. So that's the plan. So the first thing is on March 25th. And actually, the first thing is we have data information. If you can get to us by March 15th, 
and the kickoff date is March 25th. We were very anxious for you all to come. <coughs> Anybody that you have which has an interest to come, um, to come and contribute. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'll take any questions or comments at this time, Ms. Watts? Thank you. Uh, just one housekeeping question before I ask the other question. Can we get that uh, invitation uh, uh, and emails or some kind of mark your calendar immediately so we can start inviting the other folks that might be interested, especially if they're coming from out of state? So the other questions that I had was, does that mean that this group, uh, before the next budget cycle, will give us a plan on how our scholarship program should really be structured uh, both with deliverables, accountability, uh, maybe we think out of the box. Maybe it's not scholarship money up front. Maybe it's payback loans if you come work for us. They're, they're going to give some kind of comprehensive. Well, when you see those design uh, concepts, I would, in, I would expect several of those <coughs> design groups will be looking at higher education for like science and math. What kind of investments necessary to, uh, at all the entire age spectrum? And so what we what I anticipate will happen is different groups will make different recommendations, and then we'll try to synthesize and consolidate, and reconcile those uh, in time for the last final report out. So we can at that time actually um, uh, come up with. Uh, Recommendations that are doable. One more question, if you thank you. So, will we challenge um, what, have, what are probably considered pretty sacred areas about thinking out of the box, how we implement um, Head Start, JOM, um, the uh, boards program? And <coughs> sir, thank you. Because um, I just see them as separate silos now, and I think that's what you're exactly. Thinking. And so spoke to very eloquently. So that's exciting for me from my perspective. Thank you. You know, everybody I've talked to has really got excited about this because we know our education systems are not performing as, as well as they should. And we have a great opportunity to leverage those systems and actually get something better for our kids. And uh, where can we put money or resources or, or policy to actually start connecting those dots for our kids to let them achieve those childhood dreams. And it is just so exciting because we don't have to think within the <coughs> traditional silos. We have the opportunity. It's a blank page. Uh, we need to have all the intelligence we can gather and maybe make some, and make some really good recommendations. And maybe the things we're doing now is as good as they're going to get, but I just don't think so. I think we can... Uh, use this opportunity to really make a tremendous impact in education. Others? Dr. Cobb? A little bit off the subject. Can you kind of update us on where we are on that apple, about them coming down and kind of where where are we in the process on that? We went to Apple and we asked them uh, how they could help us to revitalize their language. So the and, uh, the thing they could do easiest and quickest is broker uh, games that's in charity. Because they have relationship with all the subcontractors. They've got templates out there so we could pay the preferred rate for subcontractors to do immediate games. Uh, the conceptual challenges we gave them is how do you create a virtual immersion environment? And so instead of walking into the Head Start like we do in You Only Speak Cherokee, you know, our kids don't think like us anymore. Let me ask a question, and I can't answer this, one, but Todd, maybe you can help. How many of you know what the Internet is? Okay. What? Internet. I mean, that's what the Internet is. Okay, I'm going to start with the easy one, all right? <laughs> Google, Yahoo, Face Page, Facebook, Facebook. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter, yeah, and you can go on and on and on. And so our kids don't think in fit proximity. They, they think, <coughs> and they, and uh, 
from and the way our kids think today it was only invented three to four years ago. And so they just don't think like this. And so the great challenge with Apple, who are the great thinkers in this, this uh, environment, is how do we create a virtual environment? How can they actually get online to think and act cheerfully? And so one of the options is that, that Mac right there, this computer that Todd's had since 2003, has had a Cherokee pop on it. Nobody's used it. So how do we get our kids to use it? And one of the ideas is every kid knows how to text. They can text behind it. My daughter told me the other day she can text and answer with the, the phone in her pocket. She's only got detention three times in the last two months. <laughs> but she's not as smart as she thinks she is. <laughs> but what if we created a virtual environment that we gave every kid an iPhone, which has already got that font on it, restrict all other languages, and then the only text back and forward in the cell phone? Probably the most dramatic invention of support. And so Apple is going to help us with this. And about four of those guys that just love the charity folks. And they donate their time. They're coming down for the holiday. And we're in the <coughs> So it's exciting stuff. So any other questions? Suggestions or recommendations on this process? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have announcements? Um, the next meeting of this committee is March 17th at 1 o'clock. Are there any other announcements? I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Then. So